Hi and welcome to another episode of my XL podcast. This guest is one of my favourite producers, I've got to say, and responsible for some of my favourite tracks. Not to be mixed up with <laughs> Force Mass Motion, Mike Wells. This is GTO, Tricky Disco and loads more, Mike Wells. Don't forget, we've got 1994 coming up, the future, on the 4th of March 2023 with ultrasonic die witness MC Cyclone, Mark Smith, George Bowie, Joe Deacon, Malcolm X, Lee Clark and MC Voyager. That's at the Classic Grand in Glasgow. Tickets are only £20. It's going to sell out. Be there and help us celebrate 10 amazing years of old school rave reunions with 1994. Now... On with the show and Mike's journey through music. Excel podcast. Can you see me okay in the screen and all that? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks okay. very much for taking the time to talk to us. Well, where are you? Sunny. Sunny Glasgow. It looks nice, there, is it? Well, we've got a bit of sun for now. I don't know how long it will last. <laughs> where in the world are you? I'm in Spain. Oh, wow. How long yeah. have you been living over there? 15 years now. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were, I was in the middle of London, and I was just got too much then, too crazy. So, yeah. I mean, this, this countryside here. Ah. So, uh, yeah. Especially with, the, all, with all this craziness at the moment, it was quite a good move, you know. Yeah, definitely. I'm sort of outside the city of Glasgow, yeah. and, and kind of the country, but... Away from the busyness, but, you know, and it's kind of uh -huh. good, like you're saying, when you get a bit of space about you during these times. And if you want to get crazy, you can you can go into the city if you want to. Yeah. yeah it's and it's a train or a taxi home. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Uh, so you, you're at least away from the madness most of the time. Yes. Trying. <laughs> <laughs> so, like... With this, this podcast thing that I've been doing, I've managed to speak to quite a few people and, and basically what I do is I just kind of start to, about your journey through music, you know, like basically in three parts like we spoke about, you know, like when you first were aware at a young age of music, where yeah. in the world were you and, you know, what kind of started your interest in music? Yeah, well, I grew up in Merseyside, so... The Beatles were part of the whole thing. Every, everyone, whether they were 90 or nine years old, were listening to the Beatles. So I guess that was the first thing that sort of focused on music. But I used to go out with my brother. He was a couple of years older than me. And he used to take me to parties in houses and things. And I think Motown and all that sort of music, James Brown, Motown, um, ska, reggae, all yeah. that sort of music we used to listen to, first of all. I mean, my, a lot of my school friends, they were listening to, I don't know, Neil Young, James Taylor, Joni Mitchell. So they were on that side of things. But I was I was listening to more yeah, dance-based music then, you know, ska, reggae, and, yeah. and Motown. So that sort of thing, James Brown, you know, funk. So I think that was the first real music that got me interested in in sounds and atmospheres and things like that. Yeah. Now, we'd, we'd, we'd go to people's houses and switch all the lights off and listen to music and drink whiskey and, you know, as yeah. you do. <laughs> yeah, just making your own sort of entertainment with the music in the background there. Is the internet hanging? Yeah. Well, that's a Yeah, shame. I mean, it wasn't like all the nice spots. Yeah, just hanging out with friends, yeah. Yeah, I'm just noticing there's a wee bit of a hang on the internet. Are you okay? Yeah. You hearing me okay? Yeah, fine. It just went a little bit glitchy then, but it's yeah. okay. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what was there any sort of, we spoke about it, is there any sort of particular records from uh, your past when you, when you first sort of got interested in, or, you know, there was a favourite song or you started thinking more about a love for music or... There's more to this music than, you know, what all my friends are hearing kind of thing. Yeah. 
I think I'm not sure. I think we were all into music. My, some of my friends, I don't know whether they went on to make music or, or, or whatever, but we all loved the music in the same way. Um, and I never, I never really thought then I was going to, I was going to end up making music or sounds or anything. I was much more interested in going to art college and, and making art and visual art. So it, it wasn't something I thought, ah, oh, I'm going to be a musician. I yeah. sort of got into music later um, through making art, actually. Um, I, I was doing performance art and, and visual art. I needed I needed soundtracks to go with this, oh, what I was yeah. doing. So that's, that's how I ended up making music, is because I wanted to... I, I was making tape loops and banging things and saucepans and, you know, just making like industrial sounds and noise to go with the performances I was doing. But I was at art college doing art. So listening to me early music wasn't something like, ah, I want to be a musician or anything. It, the music was always with me, but it was uh, it was more of an art thing that I wanted ah, okay. to do. I suppose um, music and art are very closely connected. You know, if... Like yourself, you started in art, and then music accompanied art. Where other people have a start of music, and then the art comes into the music, be it artwork yeah. or a, a visual performance or something. Yeah. So, well, I think punk music inspired me as well because of the because of the do it yourself sort of motivation behind things and that that sort of idea. And even now, when I make music, I make the videos and the record covers, and you know, I, I try and do everything. Yeah. A whole package, mainly because I enjoy doing it, but mainly because I, I, I still like to keep as much control as possible, you know. And it, it, at least I, I know the end product is what I want it to be, you know. Mm -hmm. And we, when we started making music initially after after when I left our college, um, we, we started making cassettes. But in the boxes we had, we were selling were sculptures, photographs, poems and music oh, that's cool. so that was the very early greater than one music which later became gto but greater than one started off as like a an art project and we made paintings as greater than one and we sold these in record shops like limited edition 50 limited edition things with sculptures in and so there was that was a combination of art and music oh, then okay. yeah. yeah i mean I, I definitely agree with you that punk rock sort of attitude where like you don't need to be a musician to yeah. to pick up an instrument you know you can do it if you want and and I think well, even that sort of attitude carried on in like early acid house you know people just giving something a try you know just, just getting the a couple of machines together and so I can make music I can do it yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's where oh yeah twiddle a few knobs and that's that sounds good let's just keep on going with that yeah. it's the same sort of attitude as punk I mean, with, with punk, I used to go to a club in Liverpool called Eric's, and uh, it was quite a chaotic club, but it was always bands on, you know, all, all the punk bands went there. And we, we used to go to the pub next door, and, and the guy who ran it, Roger Eagle, uh, we always used to pester him, can we put our band on? We didn't even have a band. We just wanted to play it, you know, and we couldn't play instruments. But yeah. everybody wanted to get on stage and just make a noise. Yeah. And that, that I think that's the same thing as, you know, now everybody wants to be a DJ and it's a little bit easier to be, to be a DJ and things. But that attitude then was, I just want to get involved, you know. And I think, yeah, the Acid House thing was the same. You know, you didn't know who the DJ was. You didn't know who made the music. But everyone, to some extent, was in, was involved, even fashion-wise. Yeah. People making statements. Yeah. So I guess that's what's missing a little bit out of the... Well, whether when club culture comes back, it might have changed with this maybe one or two years stop of club culture things will probably change now culturally in that scene yeah. because there will, there will be illegal raves and there will be things that go beyond the authority. So a whole new culture will actually come out of yeah. the situation we're in now. Maybe a new type of music, a new form of music will come out of it because that's the way things, that's the way things move. Yeah. yeah. yeah I totally agree. And I think sort of the club music did get to a, 
a point where it just became big name DJs getting paid big amounts of money, you know, doing three gigs a weekend or four on a private jet going from Ibiza to, to Stockholm to Berlin to LA. And that's just that's just crazy. Yeah. And it, getting and football player yeah. wages. Yeah, yeah, and it got out of hand, I think, you know. Yeah. And yeah, the, the, they, can, they can charge those wages because they had a public who were prepared to go there. I mean, if you look at those big Tomorrowland festivals and things, I mean, they've got four days of 100, 200,000 people or something. I mean, yeah. But I think that, to me, that's not, that's not what the scene's about or the music's about. You know, I, I, I like the intimate clubs and I like the, the contact with people. Yep. I mean, see, going, going back to what you were saying about like, it was art that sort of led you into music. Was going to art school was that quite a sort of a, not, not a risky thing, but was that quite a, a defiant thing when when maybe everyone around you's you know you know just from my own experience, you're encouraged to get a trade behind you or get a proper job and all that. Was was you encouraged to go to art school? Did your your parents behind you or? Yeah, my mum was behind me. My dad, I think, a bit more. They supported me. I mean, uh, my dad worked on the on the docks on the sea. He had a job in the in the docks as uh, maybe a draftsman or something like that. So when I when I wanted to go to art college, they thought, oh, well, you know, that's good. You can become a draftsman in the in the uh, the dock authority or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, they encouraged me. And it was, for me, it was such an exciting time, especially when I was at College in London. So, yeah, we were just running around London all night and then working in the college all day. And it was, yeah, it was stimulating. Other yeah. people, you, you learned about their music and their styles and things. And, yeah, one or two friends. I had a friend who was very good um, uh, friends with Throbbing Gristle. Uh, so he turned me on to their music. So we used to go to all the Throbbing Gristle concerts and Psychic TV after that. And uh, that was a big influence on me as well, that sort of music, industrial music. Yeah. And What, what uh, sort of year yeah. was that, Michael? What, what sort of year? That was uh, uh, 80s or so, 80s. What was that? Yeah, 83s or something yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So, so, like so yeah, that was a great... Um, we, so we saw all those sort of industrial bands, Testy Bob and Dinter Zane and Neubaut and, you know, all that stuff that was going around London at the time. And we were sort of, yeah, that, that was a big influence on the music. And that's, I started out making sort of industrial type of music, noise music, experimental music, lots of yeah. sampling and things. And uh, yeah, again, that was not really thinking about a direction of what t type of music I was going to make. It was just all, well, let's just turn it on and see what happens and make tape loops and s before, yeah. before the sound. So like you were then, saying it yeah, was more a performance got, piece? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, sort of wrapping yourself up and <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that sort of scene, would you say that was kind of like one of the precursors before, obviously, electronic music sort of really developed and was it more like rock-based? Was there, was there synthesizers involved or was it more just yeah. to make a noise? There were, well, Stopping Gristle definitely were a techno synth uh, group. They, had, they used lots of synthesizers. And their sounds were, had some sequences in them and things. So I definitely say there was techno in that. Uh -huh. But the interesting thing is, that at the time afterwards, then came the Acid House, and the, the two for me merged, and that's when we started making dance-based club music, really. Mm -hmm. And beforehand, we as Greater Than One, we recorded with a um, an industrial label called Wax Tracks in Chicago. And they put out like Front 242 and Lie Back and Skinny Puppy and KMFDM and Thrill Kill Cult, all those sort of industrial rock bands. Yeah. But they were still synth-based as well. And so there was a, a crossover between those, those types of music. And so 
I think we took our influences from industrial music and put them into the dance music. Yeah. And I think you can hear there's still an edge to some of the early music, um, even like GTO, early music. There's still a slight, a slight edge, which uh, that's why people used to think we were Belgian, because it had a sort of, sort of more Belgian Dutch industrial sound to the yeah. to the dance music rather than the the sort of funkiness of of uh, Detroit or Chicago, for example. Yeah. We, we're always m- much more attuned to perhaps a Belgian, German, Dutch type of sound. And I think you can hear that in the music. Yeah, uh, definitely. Bit, so, yeah. will we? Or can you pick two tracks from that sort of era, and then we can, like, with the magic of technology, we can insert them in, and then come back to the chat. Well, I picked a, a throbbing whistle track, and I can't remember what the other track was. I picked. was that a James Brown track. Oh, there was a James Brown track from the uh, from the early days, which is which was sort of the, and then uh, a, um, a reggae track, King Tubby uh, dub track. Uh-huh. So we'll, we'll, we'll insert them in with a the magic of technology, then we'll pick up the chat. Because <laughs> <laughs> what I do is I'll just take the audio, I'll chop the audio, I'll put the okay, stuff. Okay, and then put it in. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I mean, sorry. The James Brown, it, 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 it was 100% humanized music, but it had the the sort of loop effect to it as well. The way that the way that beat just kept chugging and chugging along, and I, I think that's what I liked about that. It sounded like electronic music because the loop was just they were yeah. so rehearsed. Those is, is uh, what was it? The JB All Stars. The JBs, yeah. They always used to uh, talk about going on the one. I suppose that emphasised the yeah. first beat, giving you that kind yeah. of loop. He trained them. He trained them like until they were drop dropping. And they just kept them going and going and going. So yeah. then when he went and said, let's count it off, bang, they would do that because they were scared of what he was <laughs> yeah. going to do. Yeah. It was such a such an organized, in a military beat. So, yeah, I think that's why probably why I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> James Brown, I mean, he was possibly one of the first sequencers. <laughs> you know, yeah, he, yeah. he's running things, you know what he wants in his head. <laughs> yeah. Brain, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, good. I mean, they, they, uh, they, also the, the musicians, they were in fear of getting their wages docked if they made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he fell out with a lot of people, didn't he? Yeah. But then I mean, see, see him out of... Bootsy Collins, I was going to say, he's come out of that camp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, two, yeah two I mean, I'm sure they, they learned a lot from that experience. Yeah, yeah. I certainly know he must have a beat anyway. <laughs> 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 so, like, like, moving on then, you were saying, like, you know, the industrial thing. I, I'm not really too clued up on the industrial side of things. You know, possibly Front 242... I don't know if you would agree, maybe early shaming for me was kind of like the closest I got to, well, front 242, and then I, th- I felt like the shaming was a wee bit maybe industrial at the start, is about the closest mm-hmm. I experienced with industrial kind of music. But you obviously you were more immersed in it, and are you seeing, like you were saying, it was mashed together with Acid House. Is, uh-huh. is club culture becoming something then, or did you feel that when you were going out and experiencing like the industrial scene, that was your club culture, if that makes kind of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and if we went if we went to a club that would play that music, they would play the sort of more dance orientated side of that music. Nitsuet, for example, yeah. I mean they crossed over into some club culture as well. I mean a lot of a lot of DJs who were playing then would play um, Nitsureb and stuff like that because it, it lent itself to that or DAF. Um, yeah, so but, so a lot of clubs would play that that type of music, especially in America. They had the whole student radio network and they would play a lot of that industrial music on the on the radio and then there would be clubs who would sort of reflect that as well and they'd play that that style of music in America in the in the sort of student clubs. And that was that was quite big in the student scene then. 
before Acid House or any sort of dance music yep. uh, happened in America. I think, that, I think. Sorry. Dance music happened on a wider level in Europe before it did in in the States. Funnily enough, Excel podcast. Podcast. the whole record shop um, culture, especially like in in the UK, people were crazy on a Saturday morning buying white labels and, yep. and waiting for the latest stuff, and that was that was exciting for DJs and punters to yep. be able to find. Um, music that was that was rare. I mean, some of those records were only pressed up in 500 or a thousand, and the amount of record shops in the UK there were there were so few records to go around. It made the made the DJ special because they had those they, yeah. they had those tracks. Yeah, and also a, a record then would stay in your bag or on a, on a DJ's playlist for for years. You know, it didn't have the the throwaway yeah. shelf life of music now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's a physical, a physical thing. Yep. The, the, you know, the process. You said you were, you were always like fusing your music into your art. What, what, what was like kind of like the? When did or did did music then become uh, something you focused on more than art, or was there a crossover? Like I said, even now you're still fusing the two. But you know, looking at your biography and the amount of uh -huh. bands and projects that you've done. It, there's, 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 a, there's a hell of a lot there. When when was this a shift, or yeah, was yeah. it a shift? Yeah, I think I think there was a shift when we did GTO Pure and Tricky Disco, and at that time I was working as a, a commercial illustrator and uh, and a fine artist in the studio. And uh, yeah, we were working hard at the weekends. We were making music, and then working all days on, on commercial art and different forms of art. And there was a time at, at that point where we had to make a decision. We're we going to go on making music or continue doing art. And uh, I, th <laughs> I made a decision. I had to go, I had to do a map, a map of London. There was a big illustrator. It was quite a big job for a company for, there was a, to go on the underground or something. And the, the client was being such a pain in the ass that <laughs> I, I went into the meeting and he, he was just such an asshole. I just threw the, the piece of paper on the, on the table and walked away. And I think that was the last piece of commercial art I did. And from then I continued making music. Yeah. Um, so that was a, that was a decision I made just because I was so pissed off with this with this guy, I thought, well, okay, that's it. I'm not going to do any more of that. So yeah, that, that, push, push, that, that was, a, that was a, the way it went. And, and it was much more fun. It was starting to gain momentum. And uh, yeah, that was, that, was, that was a time when we were so productive in music, then it didn't make sense to try and stretch ourselves and do all, all the other things. Yeah. I mean, Luckily, I've been able to continue doing it up until today, so yeah, I mean the two tracks that you you just mentioned there, pure and tricky disco, were two massive tracks, two game changers, you know, in electronic music. Mm -hmm. Where were they? Your one of your first releases, or had you done a few releases before that? We did a few before that with industrial music, GTO actually comes from greater than one yep. um started greater than one um and we made one experimental industrial album for um, a label called side effects which was run by someone called graham Ravel, who now actually do, now does uh, hollywood film soundtracks um but he he was in a band called spk and they made industrial experimental music and they put out this album for us and that album gained a bit of attention um by a label in in america called wax tracks and wax tracks are really quite a big label for industrial rock music industrial dance music as such and they put out front 242 uh and they so we made two albums for them um 
and a few singles and an EP. And some of the singles were on the dance vibe, 4-4 four, four beat, lots of samples in. Um, so they were the first sort of experiments we made with dance music. And they were they were more played in the, in the sort of American college radio network and Amer uh, college club network. Um, yeah, so that was the first time that we started to get the idea of making stuff that DJs would play. Rather than, yeah. We never thought about that beforehand. But it's also because, because Acid House and all that thing was taking off that we were started to go every now and then to, to clubs and hear the music. And then that music sort of came together. Then we made Pure and Tricky Disco off the, the, the fusion of that, those influences, really. Uh, yeah. and so they you, just, I think... Sorry. Yeah, I think Pure and Tricky Disco were the first meetings of those two things were it, it, we were trying to make dance music as, as as opposed to making music with a dance beat yeah we actually tried to make music that would that would be played in a club on a dance floor and they, they sort of worked okay yeah i mean did you is that why you went with gto to just slightly change from the greater than one just to say that this is a sort of slightly different project yeah also also um, w when we did a mail out to DJs, they, they had a real hard time writing greater than one. <laughs> it, 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 honestly, it, it, it was too much for them on the, on the response form. Yeah. So to write, to write GTO for them was a lot easier. And for us also, because they would spell greater than one. And it was just, yeah. it, they didn't have the time or they just rush it or do, maybe even did it in a club or something. So that was an abbreviation to bring it down was, uh, <laughs> Uh, that was the why we did that. Yeah. <laughs> Suppose after a rough weekend, you can quickly write the, the initials <laughs> GTO. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ten out of ten, right? Good. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you can you remember much about the recording process back then and tracks like Cure and Tricky Disco and you know what equipment you used? Yeah. Well, we had our own because we were, we made commercial art we actually managed to buy our own equipment. And we, so we had our own home studio then. So actually, I think there's only one time, no, two times we've actually been in a, in a recording studio. The rest of the time, it's been made in a, in a home studio, all the music. And we bought yeah, a big mixing desk. Luckily, we bought uh, uh, probably one of the first samplers that came into the, the Akai samplers that came into the UK. And we had um, an eight-track reel-to-reel, Tascam half-inch reel-to-reel, and all the music was made on that, I, which is why I don't have copies of it now because it's all stored on floppy disks yeah. that were linked by Simti to a, a Cubase creator in a, an Atari computer. <laughs> so it's all, it's all over the place. But uh, I see for Pure, I managed to get all the bits together now. So... People keep asking to do a remix, but I'm not sure whether I want to do it, but it's it's possibly in the process because I've got all the bits, thanks to yeah. some people, all the bits now. So. But yeah, it was all made in the home studio, all all the stuff we made, even the, the early industrial stuff and all the later stuff. So was, there was only two of you when you were producing the Great Ellen One and... Yeah, GTO. Yeah. Um, was that a, a friend or colleague that you had met at art school? That you decided to work together on music. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was my girlfriend, and then became wife. Um, we worked together, lived together, did everything together. Really. Yeah. Um, yeah, and with I do a lot of recording. She'd come in and finish it. Sometimes she'd start something, so we'd we'd take it in turns to do things. Yeah. But uh, we worked in the same commercial art stuff together, so. Yeah, we were we were there twenty four seven together making making stuff and the, and then we we people said can you do some live shows so we ended up doing some live shows and putting visual things together and when we couldn't do that we sort of we said oh we'll come and DJ then we'd never DJ before ever so we bought some decks and a couple <laughs> of weekends learned how to DJ and then we said oh yeah now we're DJing so. That was that was a, a good way of doing a live show without having to 
to uh, turn up with all the videos and, and stuff. Yeah. I mean, again, that's maybe that punk rock uh, attitude. I just, yeah, I'll give it a go, DJ. Give me a shot of that. I think the ver- the first DJ thing we did was a quite a big club in Frankfurt, I think. And uh, yeah, we just we just took to it as you do. And uh, yeah, if you're fearless enough and you want to do it, you just do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I get the there's so many kind of geeky questions I want to ask you about certain tracks and all that. I mean, even like, like pure the string sound and pure, and then the wee sort of almost flute kind of melody thing and all that. Are those samples or is that uh-huh. something that you've created? The, the flute was a sample. The string was something we created. Um, I can't say where the flute sample comes from. Right, but I do that. <laughs> <laughs> People always say, where did that come from? Um, it's it's pretty obscure anyway, so I don't think many people would. I used to always uh, tape stuff off the TV, TV and just run through it and run through it and find samples. And, you know, that was the way of starting point of, of a lot of music. Like, want to be a hippie, that was just the starting point, was just a sample. Yeah. You know? um, was it the vocal was a sample? So that? Was the, yeah, the, the, yeah, want to be a hippie, was that a vocal sample that started that track? The vocal sample, yeah, it was taken off a film of a guy. It was a guy playing acoustic guitar and just speeded up the sample. It was just a normal guy going, "I wanna be a hippie." Uh-huh. And uh, only later we found that found out that the, it was actually quite a famous guy that did it. And so we contacted him and said, "Can we use the sample?" Blah blah blah. So we cleared the sample finally, which was quite good. But yeah, that was just taken off a. Of, on a rainy afternoon in London off a of videotape. <laughs> Brilliant. And the, even like the tricky yeah. disco thing, that, that full track, you know, came along with it, the, the full sort of bleep sound and all that. I mean, what was this kind of thinking process behind that? Um, well, we, 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 we'd we signed Pure to the label in Holland called Go Bang. And when we went over there, we went to a few a few clubs in Amsterdam and heard all this music. And I think at the time, it was eight or eight states, Pacific states, and that sort of sound. Um, and they were playing, yeah, I think Go, Go Bang had also just just done techno trance. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And we, we were sort of get, got influenced by all those sounds and the Sheffield sound. Uh, uh, test tone and all those sort of things and so we were aware, aware of uh, all that music because we sort of immersed ourselves into the into the clubs to hear what the what the sounds were yep. and i really like the idea of making sounds from tones and the, and we sampled like we used to be able to pick up the phone and get the um speaking clock beep yeah and so we sampled those those sort of tones and that that's that's actually used in tricky disco and pure wow. the, the sort of speaking clock you can hear just as a whoop. and uh, yeah so we have, we're interested in just like making music out of pure tones so that's that's how that came about uh-huh. and as these tracks are kind of you know, more so the tricky disco thing, that sort of blew up commercially. Did you find yourself being involved in maybe the video side of things and artwork? Yeah, or we, the- made the, yeah we made the video for, for the tricky disco. Uh, we called up some companies and got some stock footage and then filmed some stuff in our garden in London. And that was in there. <laughs> it was funny because it was on top of the pops and we made a little robot animation and they say, ah, look, it's our garden on top of the pops and that was like, <laughs> <laughs> thankfully we didn't have to go on top of the pops but uh, yeah it was quite it was interesting at that time it was it was such a bit but it what was it was faceless techno music so nobody really were interested in the people behind it it was the track that was the thing mm. uh, I, I quite like that it was uh, the track was famous not us Mm-hmm. And and it was the music that was doing the the work, and so yeah, that was it was quite nice about that, and it still is really. I mean, I can, you know, I'm not a famous person, so I can still make music on on lots of different levels. And no one's ever 
bothered me for that reason. So yeah. that, that I like. <laughs> Do you, then what's the reason behind having so many aliases and different projects? Is it just you want different pigeonholes for different music or different frames of mind? Or? It was a, I think it's a twofold thing. It was it, one, it was practical because some people would say, uh, can you make a, a, a project for us? So I think XL Records said, can you, can you do something for us? We said, oh, yeah, we'd love to, but, you know, we, we do Tricky Disco with Warp and we do GTO with these people. And then, so we made up a new name just because it, it, it was practical, really, to do so. And then, yeah, it's, it, it also suited the type of music. Like Church of Ecstasy was hard, abrasive acid. Yeah, and that, that sort of, you know, it helped us to sort of pigeonhole it as well to some yeah. extent. But it, it was, you know, it, it was half, half of it was a practical reason as well, really. Yeah. Excel podcast. What would you say would be your first big commercial success? Would that have been Tricky Disco? When it, was that the one that really blew up for you? Yeah, well, the funny thing is Tricky Disco and Pure were out at the same time. Um, wow. Um, Tricky Disco got higher in the in the top 40, but there was a problem with Pure because the record label in Holland, the, we signed it then to Cool Tempo Records, Pure, and yeah. Cool Tempo Records were about to build it up to release but they were still getting white labels coming from Holland wow. into all the record shops and that that killed a lot of the momentum of the sales because they they just kept and we were phoning up saying can you stop selling these things we've signed it now to another label you know you're part of this so it, it, you're only hurting yourself if you keep selling it but you know in those days I don't know distributors wanted to sell things people wanted to sell things so whatever happened and the the white labels just kept flooding and flooding and flooding and by the time it was released on cool tempo there wasn't that you know midweek sales impact yeah. that, the, the, that they normally would have got so that was that was a bit of a shame but mm -hmm. it's, uh, so so it sold I, I say it probably sold the same amount as tricky disco but not on that commercial level yeah, for obviously because white labels don't get the barcodes and it's not getting scanned and yeah, yeah, yeah. And in those days, it was just purely sales. It didn't include radio play or anything like that. So yeah, I mean, I, I would love to include those two just because of personal favourites of mine as well. You know, yeah, yeah, in yeah. the chat, and so if we, if we inserted them in here, <laughs> that'd be good, yeah. and, and then we come <laughs> back. So I mean, those tracks, like you, you put the two of them out. The two of them have done really well. Are you, are you, are you starting to find the pressure of the industry? Is that affecting you in any way? You, no. You... no. To, I mean, to some extent, I've never been, and we were never in the music biz. And I never, I still don't feel as if I'm part of the music business. Never had a manager, never had an agent, never had, a, we had a lawyer at the beginning. Uh, it cost us so much money that we thought we can do this ourselves. Yeah. So that went out the window. Um, so, you know, it, we always tried to have control. And if, if you're in the music business, I mean, now people have got an Instagram account. They've got a lawyer. They've got a, an accountant. They've got all the, before they've even made a track. Yeah. I mean, you know, they've, all, they've got selfies and they've got everything before they've even got into music. And yeah. by the time they make music, they're just copying something they've heard anyway. I mean, that's why there's so much music out there. You know, look at look at Beatport Top 10 or something. The whole, most of it sounds the same. The same programs, the same kick drums, the same, you know, there's, there's not that innovation. People, yeah. people would rather get famous before they even make anything or do anything. So, yeah, I never felt part of the music business. And, and in that way, we could always make it on a friendly level. Like when we made music with uh, Rising High, it was only because we met Casper Pound and, and his crew. And they, they were such friendly, nice people. And yep. we, we were happy to make music with them. And 
that's the way, you know, like with war purpose, we had to be involved with them because they were genuine people. So well, we always took it on a, on a people level, really. Yeah. And even now, if I, if I, if I don't like the people, I don't have to work with them. Yeah. I'd rather work with people I respect and like. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I, I don't know for me if it's, it's just the, the longer I've been involved, it's more about working with the right people and enjoying the process of working with friends or, or like-minded people. Because I think yeah. the, the music business it, it's definitely two-sided, isn't it? There's a the music and then there's a the business, you know, and, and if you get tied up with the yeah. business, your music suffers. If you focus too much on the music, somebody will come along and take advantage of your business side, you know, and, and it's really hard to juggle. Yeah. But again, maybe it's, that, again, harking back to that punk rock attitude of you're doing it all yourself and you don't need it, you, you don't need to comply to the rules of you must have a manager, an agent, or... Uh, I think... And also... I, I don't think I can say I've never made music uh, to make money. It's, it's never been a question. Yep. You know, when when I was working quite happily, and it, it was a hobby making music, and I, I, I think it still is a hobby. I like I like doing it, and it's not to make money. It's not to try and make money at all. Mm. You know, it, I, if the, the worst thing I can do is make a piece of music that I think will fit into something, that's the that's the most um, cynical way I, uh, of me of, of, of uh, making music. But that's just because I want to design something that will be played in a certain situation, but not to make money. I mean, if money, if, if things make money, we have made money from it. But that's, that's not the, that's not the starting point at all. Yeah. If you, if you're in it for the money, then you're going to make crap music anyway. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, that's that's a great uh, attitude, and it, and it's and it's probably something that served you well right to right to this this point because it's it's only when again through personal experiences the pressures you feel it, it's from a third party, it's from a record label wanting something more like that again, and you feel yeah, like yeah, yeah. you need to deliver. This, something similar but better, you know, rather than just doing what you want to do. I, I, yeah. I don't. I, I would even be. I, I would even think if maybe more than ninety percent artists now, if they're honest with themselves, I don't think they're actually writing music they really want to make. I think no, it's a small, no. a small majority of people that actually do the music that they want to do. Yeah, I'd see, I'd see I you're one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After all these years, <laughs> yeah. still thinking. But yeah, that's because I enjoy it. You know, I'm, I'm doing what I want to do. So, yeah. But I mean, and it's not about it's not about sales or anything. If anything, it's just about getting stuff out there and enjoying doing it. Yeah, I mean, you're working with, you know, like you mentioned Warp, which is a massive label. Uh, Casper, you know, working with people that you want to work with. So then, by doing so, are you ruling out any pressures from those people asking for a follow-up hit, or can you do something like? Have you never had those conversations, or not really? No, people, people always were really quite open to what what came along. I mean. I did an album for Earache Records, and they're they're a thrash metal label. Um, and the guy running it wanted wanted me to do a hardcore type of type of style, but um, Lee had just died, and I Want to Be a Hippie had just been a big hit, and I'd made some Gabba hardcore techno type of things. And I really didn't want to make that type of music, so I made I made a, an album for him, uh, "Signs of Chaos," but it's 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 a dark album, and uh, that's the way I was thinking yeah. and feeling. So I I couldn't make a, a hardcore techno thing for him. It, was, it just didn't fit. So I said, "This is what I've made," you know. Can you put it, you know, put it out if you want to, accept it. And, you know, good for him, he put it out. And it's 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 different to what he normally puts out on his label. So, 
And I, I, I think if I listen, I don't listen to it much. But if I do listen to it, it you know, it's quite a dark record, really. And I think it reflects the, the, the way I was feeling yeah. at the time. Yeah. So no, no one's no one's really pressured to to. I'm not a commercial producer in that sense, you know. So no one's really come to me and said, "Oh, make this a hit or do this." So it's never been an issue, no. Yeah, I mean, the more I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm just the more I'm realising you. Know, I, I, the, the art background and mu- music really is an art form for you. Would you? Would you? Am, am I right in thinking that? Well, I think so. Yeah, I mean, a great influence on me art-wise was was Dada and the and the cut up mm-hmm. of, of, of of that movement, and I think. Music-wise, like with with sampling, I do the same. I, I layer things and sometimes start with a sample, sometimes not. But I, I never start music with a with a with a. For example, a lot of people think I've got this tune in my head, this bass line or something. I never do that. I've never done that. I never had a a tune in my head ever. I start from a practical. I've got this sound and I'm going to build around it. And that's normally how I make the music. And that's a similar way to the way I used to make, or still do make pictures, by cut up, cut a, cutting up, pasting, in, in a visual sampling way. So this is, for me, there is a similarity between those, those two things, visual art and the sound. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't go as far, I mean, when we, st- <laughs> when we started out, we would we would try and play the art cars to like NME, and they they hated they hated it. They didn't want to hear the word art and music together. They just they just didn't want to know. And most of these kids were like suburban kids who wanted to be urban kids. Yeah. And to them, art, art was just the wrong word. And we met some of these people who wrote for NME, and, and they just didn't want to know about art. And you know, eventually we we got the message that it's. It's not a good idea to shout too much about art because it, it, it still it still sort of offends people. Mm. You know, they think, oh, that's a you know a privileged hoity-toity type of thing or whatever, and yeah. they really don't want to know about it. So, I think I've learned over the years not to not to shout too much about it. To to make, although people are a lot more open now. Yeah, In those days. If you talked about art to, and tricky disco in the same in the same sentence, then <laughs> it was like. Okay. I am um, that. I mean, I I I, I don't know. Well, you know, when you'd mentioned um, it, Lee passing and stuff, and you you produced this dark album. Had had you ever, had you even thought or contemplated maybe? Did you lost interest in music, or you know, my, uh, uh, you can only you yeah, can talk. As, I did. Well, yeah, I, yeah, it must, yeah, must I have did. been. A... Yeah, because the funny thing is, it, she died exactly the time that that uh, the I want to be a hippie was was a hit, yeah. <laughs> and you know, the, the music. Not that uh, not that I want to be a hippie. The the sort of version that came out and was on the radio was really representative of our music but you know we were part of we were part of it and that was just yeah a big a big hit and that that whole time for me it was uh yeah difficult to deal with extremely yeah. difficult to deal with and they were, you know and to try and continue so yeah i did step back away from that after i think after six months or a year then uh, the music i made was extremely gentle <laughs> extremely minimal um yeah it wasn't it wasn't that open and yeah it, it, it took me a while even recently it's only just i've only just started to open up again about music yeah funnily enough it took a, it took a long time for me to to really get back into making music that I wanted to make. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it was a yeah, it was a big. We were if you if you can imagine it, we were 
we were reaching something we wanted to do and we worked together for for yeah eight years or more yeah uh, and then it was all just taken away yeah and that was just, yeah such a big blow so yeah, yeah. Not the most pleasant time. <laughs> yeah, I, I can only I can only imagine, Michael. I mean, even um, you know, as you're saying, this, the track's blown up. It's massive. If, if, if you're hearing it on the radio or whatever, it's a, a constant reminder of what what you've been through, what you're going through. It must have been a, a, a really yeah, trying yeah. time. Yeah, and I was I was not under pressure, but. I had to do, still continue doing promotion and interviews and things. And that was just, it just didn't make sense. But the situation was so bizarre that I just kept on doing it. I didn't even think. I even made, kept doing uh, some tracks after it to try and continue the whole thing. But just nothing felt right. It was just bizarre. You know, yeah. I, I was flying up to Germany to do, to do a TV show. <laughs> you know, and and, and we I, we just buried Lee. Uh, yeah. It just didn't make sense. You no, know? it was crazy. So I did it, and I continued doing it. But it wasn't uh, it wasn't something I. Would, I, th- I think in hindsight, I probably would have just should have just cut off. But I kept on doing it for for her and for me, basically. Yep. I think. So yeah, it wasn't 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 the easiest of times. Yeah. No, <laughs> I mean. I guess there's maybe that thinking where you're throwing yourself into work to try and take your mind off what's happening, but equally yeah. your work is what the two you had created. So it's I don't I don't think you could have yeah. won whatever way you decided to do. You know, it's uh, yeah. So yeah, and we, and we, we had a, a techno head album which had our work on it. So you know, and people wanted to talk about it. So yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. No, not the best of times, I don't think. But it definitely affected, yeah, up until, I'd say up until now, recently, the, yeah. the way I make music. Uh, it's only now I've, I've, in the past, maybe in the past two years, I've found a, a freedom in making music again and really enjoying it more. Yeah. And I think it shows the results. The results are better and the reactions are better. Yeah. Pe- people seem to respond to the... The music I'm making now uh, a, a lot better than I, I made a lot of, not to say experimental music, but very very down tempo music over the over the past ten ten years or so, twenty years, and not much up tempo music. A couple of tracks, but only recently that I really got into making something with life and energy in it again. You know. Mm-hmm. I spent a long time playing golf, <laughs> you know, and not making music at all. Yeah, just, just giving yourself a break from it. Well, I mean, I think yeah, yeah, yeah. the the journey that you've been on, you know, you've you've just always d- done what you wanted to do, and I think you know yeah. it, sh- it shows just over this conversation, you know. I am um, back then when you write music to to now. Is there certain pieces of equipment that you used back then that you're still using now, or has anything been with you all the time? Favorite bits of equipment? No, no everything's new now, totally. So I, if I'm in the studio now, and uh, I've still got bits of stuff that's been sitting there for 25 years, I haven't touched. <laughs> I've got mixing desks, to, you know. Tons of equipment. I just don't touch them now because everything's. I work totally digital now, so everything's in the computer. So everything's new. It's all software. Yep. So uh, the biggest thing I still use is a sampler. So if if you look at one of my projects, I've got maybe twenty samplers open, all with samples in them, and maybe two soft synths, and that's about it. I. I yeah, I don't use any outboard equipment or any any hardware or anything. It's all it's all digital. Yeah. So yeah, everything's changed in that sense, which I like. It's it's a quicker quicker process for me as well. I like to work quickly, so it suits me like that. Yeah, is there a particular door that you're using that you've you've stuck by, or are you always changing that? Uh, I, I use Logic now, 
So uh, the iTried Cubase, maybe it's okay, but uh, Logic to me, it works better. And I've got Ableton and things, but Logic still, for me, is the is the one that works the best. So I stick with that really. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I've I've just bought the the new Logic, um, but I still use an old version of Logic, and it works as long as my computer keeps on turning on. Yeah. So I keep on using that until I'm slowly going into the new system. But um, if it, I know how it, how it works, and I, I'm uh, I feel easy. I'm also I've not moved to the new version of Logic but a few friends that I know have said that the, the new sampler is the kind of shining light of the latest Logic so it might be interesting yeah. Yeah. to see what that offers yeah I, I played around with it and it's yeah it looks good I mean I, I use contacts as a sampler because it's such such an easy thing to use and so no, I don't. I don't think musical equipment should be complicated. I mean, <laughs> we're not scientists. Yeah. So as long as you can make noise with it quickly and and without reading a manual, to me that's the best thing. And yeah. if I have to read a manual, then forget it. You know, I, I've bought some synths over the over the years. I just say I'm not even going to bother with it. Yeah. And you know? not even not even try because you have to patch it, and uh, that's not for me. You know, I, I want to load something up, start messing with it, and start getting into it. And it should be intuitive. You know, yep. so for you know, me, I, I don't want to. I don't want to waste time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some, some. I think some manuals are great for holding doors open. You know, that's that's. <laughs> you know, I think. Yeah, exactly happy accidents and you know things happening without really knowing what specifically what you're doing you get the best results sometimes yeah. you know yeah. uh, again is that harking uh, back <coughs> sorry yeah, Michael, I was going to say, is that so. harking back to that punk rock ethos kind of thing yeah. you know yeah I like it when you can you can I mean sometimes I just I'll just fall on the keyboard just to put some notes in there just to see what it sounds like but I like the, there's a synth I use called Silent. You probably know that, and that's so easy to use, and and you can get some great sounds from it. You can program it easy, and uh, yeah, if I can turn that on and get so, something going quickly, and, and an idea quickly, you know, the next day I might change the sounds or do something. But at least I'm working with it and getting yeah. something going. And to me, that's important. Is is to be able to get something working. And then the next day you come back to him and say, well, it doesn't sound right, but there's something there. Yeah. And that's the way I like to work. So at least you're, you know, at least you're working. And I think a lot of people, the, the question with making, making music is, uh, how, do I, how do I finish and how do I start and how do I continue? And you, you've, got to, you've got to start working and start um, sequencing and programming as soon as possible. Don't don't, don't stick on that four bar loop for yeah. three days. And I think I think a lot of producers get into that of like this loop, 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 without setting out a, a structure to something. And once you start with the structure, you can you can place and you can start getting into it a lot easier than if you're stuck on this loop. For for me, that's the best the best way to actually progress from the from the from the from the loop <laughs> is to yeah. start building. Otherwise, you're stuck with this loop. Ah, it's driving me mad. I've been listening to the same loop for <laughs> ten hours or something. Guilty. <laughs> I mean, everyone knows that. It's horrible. That. Exactly. It's a terrible thing, isn't yeah. it? I mean, <laughs> the the sample quality and the sample libraries you can get your hands on now. Are unbelievable, you know. But do you still find yourself maybe trolling the internet for obscure samples, or are you, are you doing a bit of both? Yeah, yeah, a bit, bit of both. Yeah. Sometimes I'll use a, a sample as a starting point and then recreate it myself, or, or copy the notes, or copy the structure, but with other sounds. Sometimes, if I'm looking for something specific, I'll, I'll look on the internet or some old records or something. I still troll through some old records and, you know, flick through them and the, yeah, old brass band yeah, yeah. <laughs> acapellas or something. 
Just to try and find some it. kind of sample somewhere. Yeah, the worst thing is if you know what you want, then you can't yeah. and you can't find it. Then you then it takes you hours. And you go, oh, this is just driving me. But yeah, you it, then you, when you find it, you say, ah, it's, it fits, it fits. Yeah. So yeah, it's still it's still a nice part. Uh, I mean, when when I was an illustrator and I I was doing basically collage, I'd have on my desk I'd have boxes. And the boxes that would be eyes, mouths, ears, faces, uh, which I'd cut out from books, magazines. I'd buy yeah. loads of books and cut out. And so I had um, a sample library of images where I could, where I, for, for my collage. So it's the same with the music as well. If, if I have a, a bank of things, vocals and certain sounds that at some point I know I can go back to and think, I'm sure there was a sound there that I could... I could use and I can go back to it and find it quite easily Yeah. rather than trucking through too many things. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So looking back and forward, is there any tracks in particular you're most proud of from your back catalogue and then to sort of finish the show, can we play a couple of tracks that you where you're at right now? Um, if, okay. Well, if you said you wanted to play pure and tricky disco which is quite nice so we can play those from the back um but recently i just released so, sorry michael are those f personal favorites of yours you know they, they're they'll have been slotted into the show already i mean are they is there any ones okay. in particular you're most proud of from your back your vast back catalog uh, i there's one track that I like and, and lots of people still like and I, I it's um, a techno head track, The Passion. And I think it's it's not a hardcore track. It's it's a hard techno track. And it's got elements of I don't know, trance, but not trance in that in the formal sense. And uh, it's funny people still play it now and, and it still sounds fresh. Yeah. And I remember hearing it clubs and it, and it really still sounds yeah it still does the business if, if you if you like so that that's that's quite if people haven't heard it maybe it's quite nice for them to hear that yeah if you're familiar with it yourself I, I, I know you know I know the names it's not until I listen to these things I get you know obviously like Pure Tricky Disco and uh, Church Exit straight away I know the tracks but again it's such a vast catalogue you've got to try and remember them all but I'll definitely dig that one out for a listen just because you, you, you're particularly proud of it as well um, yeah yeah. it just came into my head you know what the techno head thing was like championing this sort of GABA sound and all that what was it that, that attracted you to that again I'm just imagining it's the industrial edge side of things and the, just that kind of raw as did I answer my own question there? <laughs> I think, well, the thing is, at the time, the, the music biz uh, in the UK was was all a bit, all a bit fairy, fairy, I don't know, the mu techno music sort of was getting all a bit too melodic and a bit too Pete Tong or whatever. Yeah. And that, and suddenly this fresh sound of anger and energy came out and, and it, it was just fantastic, you know, and, and it had humor and it was just, it was just energy, fresh. Yeah. And started, when we started DJing with it, the response was fantastic. People loved it. And uh, we loved the music and we wanted to get involved with it. And the funny thing is that going back to GoBang Records when we released Pure, the Dutch label, the A&R for GoBang was also the A&R for Mokum Records, who were part of the whole yeah. GABA thing. And so it wasn't hard for us to get in contact and say, we'd like to make a track for Mokum. We'd like to be involved in this this scene. And uh, not that we made GABA as such, but hard techno, hardcore. And uh, that, so it was quite easy for us to get involved in that scene as well. And because 
initially Lee was writing a, a column for DJ magazine, techno column. Um, and we combined, then we, we would get all the records sent to us as well. So we were privileged to hear all the records and we'd go to the, to the record shop and buy all the records, all the imports. So we were so involved in this hardcore scene and, and techno as well at the same time. But the hardcore really, yeah, it was just so inspiring that it was not, it was just so nice to get involved with it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think it was just the energy of it. And it was so against the, I don't know, the prissy industry of the UK at that time. You know, mm-hmm. no one was, no one was playing it. No radio would play it. So to us, it was a rebel, a rebellion type of music. Yeah. And uh, even though not many clubs would play it, you know. So it was nice to turn up and sudden and play this music. And and people, I mean, a couple of clubs didn't like that we played it. <laughs> yeah, I think I can remember yeah. a couple of clubs we we got asked to stop. But um, <laughs> or, uh, can we play something a bit slower yeah. or a bit quieter? Um, but generally, it was, it was the the public responded so. Yeah, and it was great music. I mean, it had a great period of, of hardcore, which is fantastic. I mean, there's some interesting hardcore being made now as well. But I think techno is more interesting now. And that's combined. Techno now is, is for me, is, is evolving again into something a little bit harder, a little bit more attitude-wise. Mm-hmm. And it's combining hardcore and industrial music. And there's some great artists out now that are doing that with techno so that's that's the way i see my music and and techno music evolving becoming a lot more a lot more tougher even darker yeah and another double question for you as you you mentioned who who's who's who are you impressed with just now and who what artists impressed you in the dance scene back then well, that's a difficult question. It's always difficult to say yeah. who. Uh, or if you can mention any of that you enjoyed working alongside or you liked certain things that they've done. Or, I know it is a hard question. Uh, I mean, the people at Rising High, I mean, the, the, the output of Rising High Records was, was fantastic. But equally, I mean... Yeah, I mean, we we were on XL Records when the Prodigy were there, um, and they've been. They, I mean, good luck to them. They've been fantastic, and they had a great career out of making the music they wanted to make as well. Yep. Um, and it's just so many producers out there. I mean, uh, early early Todd Terry. I mean, were influences to us. Um, I mean, and now there's so many producers. And, uh, it's hard to say. <laughs> yeah, you're right. In what you're saying, I think. I mean, I can I could probably run off this, but where do you start? Where do you start? Yeah. Yeah. So, is there any sort of your socials? Uh, where people can get in touch with you or hear your new music? Is there any because there are sites or that you want to plug on this? Uh, well, we just managed to put all the back catalogue on Bandcamp, so all the older GTO, Tricky Disco, John and Julie, Church of Ecstasy, Greater Than One, and the newer projects um, that I've been doing are all mostly available there on Bandcamp now. So, which is, Bandcamp's a fantastic thing because you can you can listen to the track, you can, if you don't want to buy it, you don't have to buy it, so, and, and you can, it's it's a great it's a great platform I think you know you can listen to the whole track rather than just like the breakdown or something that you can listen to on some platforms. So it's uh, it's a, it's a really and you're in touch with people. So you know if people buy something, you know you get an email saying who bought it. I mean it's it's a fantastic thing. Yeah. So I'd say Bandcamp was, was really quite a nice one of the platforms I, I like to use and I like to, to to direct people to because it's such a, there's no pressure to buy anything. If you want to buy something, then fine. So, um, and going, going back, I mean, I spent 
the last few years making lots of down tempo music as well, ambient music uh, with my solo project. And I guess to finish, what would be nice is I've just recently released something with Lenny D's label called uh, um, Hard Electronic. That's the name of his label, which is a harder techno track. Um, but I just released an album on, on Bandcamp on my own Dataflow label called Quiet Techno, which is quiet techno. So it's not club techno. It's techno to listen to in your living room or in a quiet situation. So I wanted to design something which was li- listening techno. So that's the two sides of what I've done recently. Oh, yeah. It might be quite interesting for people to hear. So there's two sides of the... One is the harder, more abrasive techno, and one is the quieter side of it. Yeah. That's a great way to, to end it. I mean, I, I, you know, Lenny's such a great guy as well. Um, you're obviously keeping in, in, in touch and working with people that you, you want to be involved with. Uh, and and to, to, to showcase the two sides yeah. of things. Yeah. This is a wee bit of a lag here with internet. Are you hearing me okay? Yeah, yeah, fine. <laughs> oh. Uh, it's, it's, it's strange how it, when it drops, you're, you're wondering if you can be heard or if you're speaking. Or... Yeah, yeah. I think it's come back now. Is that okay. right? Yeah, it's okay now. Yeah. But... Yeah. Okay. Michael, it's been absolutely fantastic chatting with you. It's been a, it's been incredible listening to your journey through music. <laughs> During this, thank, thank, thank. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm, it's slightly difficult with. It. I, I think it must be my end. The internet's just kind of lagging every now and again. Just, just like the last okay. couple of minutes there. Uh-huh. I'm sure we'll have everything. Uh, but like like I said, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you and, okay. and talking to you. Pleasure talking to you as well. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully hopefully and, uh, one of these one of these days I can talk, twist your arm to coming over to Glasgow and playing a DJ set for us here in Glasgow. Yeah, that's people uh, that's one thing I've had I get so many offers to go and do it and I I stopped a long time ago doing it. I thought, I'm not going to bother doing that anymore, but it's always tempting. I, I, I never say never, I yeah. guess, that's the thing. <laughs> I think I think if you can get your mindset into cherry-picking and maybe making a holiday out of it or a, or a small vacation, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is it but listen it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you you know you've been an in- a big inspiration in, in what I do and it's been great listening to your story thanks Facebook DJ Maloka Lee I've been up for four days I don't know what's right and wrong anymore oh, wow this stuff's incredible Excellent. podcast